Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final lecture of the 2019 Harold J. Berman Forum in Law and Religion. For those who may be joining us for the first time today, my name is Silas Allard, and I am the Managing Director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture on behalf of the Center. The Center for the Study of Law and Religion is a thought leader dedicated to producing innovative scholarship, facilitating challenging conversations, convening the best minds, and training the next generation of academics, lawyers, and religious leaders for the emerging conversation in law and religion around the world. We are proud to have led this field of study for over 35 years through path-breaking research projects that have produced over 350 monographs and journal symposia, our three book series with leading academic publishers, the preeminent journal in the field, the Journal of Law and Religion, six graduate degree programs, and dozens of interdisciplinary courses around the campus, as well as important conversations, such as the lecture we are privileged to host this afternoon. I encourage you to learn more about the Center's work through our website, and you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For the past three days, we have probed the possibility of pursuing a common good in the context of human diversity, particularly religious diversity. Our prior two lecturers have raised for our consideration real and enduring challenges. Professor Stanley Fish in his lecture Monday raised the challenge of the irreconcilable a prioris in liberalism as a political philosophy and, at a minimum, in strong religious claims. The conflict between a liberal commitment to individual conscience and a strong religious claim to exclusive truth. In yesterday's lecture, Professor Jonathan Walton, drawing on civil rights history, argued that the interconnected development of liberal political thought and American Protestant Christianity has, in some circumstances, given a veto of sorts to individual conscience claims in the public sphere, foreclosing the robust public critique and debate over the justice content of those claims. Today's lecture furthers this critical inquiry in two important ways. First, it provides us an opportunity to move outside of a narrow concern with these issues in the context of the United States, helping us to avoid the temptation, as my colleague Michael Broyd writes in a forthcoming editorial in the Journal of Law and Religion, to quote, think that the way it is in our own society is the only way it really can be. Second, today's lecture explores the messy mutual constitution of identity and religious practice that can leave both those outside of a tradition and those inside of a tradition uncertain about the scope, nature, and purpose of religious claims. The idea of Europe has long depended on a differentiation from the Muslim societies of the Levant and North Africa. Anwar Majid has written in his book, We Are All Moors, that the Muslim other represents, quote, a consistent strain of vilifying difference that has been essential to national unity since the 15th century. But Europe has also contributed to the constitution of Muslim-majority societies through colonial legalities that have left many post-colonial states in the Muslim world with understandings of law as necessarily state-enforced positive law. In the midst of this co-constitution, the rich and complex Islamic concept of Sharia has been reduced to an object of fear on the one hand, a signifier of dangerous otherness, and a narrowly construed set of legal obligations on the other. But these dual reductions, like most reductive moves, are unhelpful to both the Muslim and the non-Muslim community in Europe, and should raise a flag of warning for other contexts, our context included, where the religion of a dangerous, exotic other is domesticated 
to use the language of Professor Fish from Monday. <clears throat> Our guide into these questions today, Professor Mona Siddiqui, knows these contours well. As a scholar of Islamic jurisprudence and ethics, as well as Christian-Muslim relations, Professor Siddiqui is the first Muslim to hold a chair in Islamic and interreligious studies at the University of Edinburgh, where she was appointed in 2011. She also holds, holds the posts of Assistant Principal for Religion and Society and Dean International for the Middle East at the University of Edinburgh. And prior to moving to Edinburgh, she worked at Glasgow University, directing the Center for the Study of Islam. She is the author of numerous books, chapters, and articles, including as mere exemplars of her scholarly range. Her 2015 Yale University Press title, Hospitality in Islam, Welcoming in God's Name. The four-volume collection, Muslim Christian Encounters, that was published in 2016 by Rutledge. And her forthcoming monograph on human struggle, based on her 2016 Gifford Lectures. Professor Siddiqui's scholarly work has made great contributions to Islamic studies and significantly advanced the possibility for meaningful interreligious encounter in what, as I noted before, is a fraught history of identity formation between Europe and its Muslim neighbors and citizens. But Professor Siddiqui also approaches these issues as a prolific public scholar. She's a regular commentator in the media, known especially for her appearances on BBC Radio 4 and BBC Radio Scotland's Thought of the Day. And in June 2016, she became a panelist on BBC Radio 4's award-winning The Moral Maze, among many other media appearances. Professor Siddiqui chairs the BBC's Religious Advisory Committee in Scotland, and in April 2016, she was invited by the British Home Office to lead an independent review of Sharia councils in the United Kingdom, with the report having been published by the Home Office in February of 2018. With this combination of academic depth and scope and extensive experience engaging the public debate and religious communities in the UK, we could not hope for a more learned or wise voice to conclude the 2019 Harold J. Berman Forum. It is my pleasure and honor to invite Professor Mona Siddiqui to the lectern. So what I hope to do today is actually give a series of reflections which for me encapsulate um, Silas's very um, apt summary of what I'm trying to say. Um, reflections not just on law, Sharia, but also how law and Sharia and religious issues are discussed in public life in Europe as a whole, but with a specific reference to the UK. And I think part of what I want to say is that the discussion of law and political theology is really how religion and religious observance and its tensions are lived out in a secular state. So I want to set the scene and then move to certain brief case studies of the limits of law and pluralism. In much of Western Europe today, despite, for example, the Catholic Church being a dominant force in France, the Church of England, the established church in the UK. When we speak of societal norms and laws, the default position for most is that we live in secular societies, liberal democracies in which the state is sovereign above all other institutions. This can mean that despite a person's own faith or practices or values, it is the state which to some extent decides the religious from the non-religious the public from the private, and the political from the personal. When it comes to Western Europe, we need to add the perceived challenges of the state's relationship to religious communities. And I don't want to be monolithic about what we mean by religious communities, or even try to explain what religion means as a defined category of doctrines and practices. The main concern of the state is the law's relationship to religious exceptionalism. This is against a Europe which is going through its own soul searching. Is Europe's Christian past going to be its Christian future? Or is Europe's Christian past now going to be replaced by secularism? What holds Europe together apart from its economic ties, its cultural values? And as some of you know, I don't want to mention the B word, 
but that, that we're completely inundated by the discourse on Brexit is in fact a reflection of various tensions, not just in the UK, but in Europe as a whole. What is the European project? It was Giorgio Agamben who in 2013 revived the idea of a union of southern European countries, a proposal first launched by another philosopher, Alexandra Kozhev, just after World War II, where he announced whether the Latin Empire could act as a counterweight to the dominant role played by Germany in the European Union. Europe pays homage to the spiritual heritage of religion, and while it mentions the role of churches, like the draft constitution of 2004, the Lisbon Reform Treaty does not specify which spiritual or religious heritage is inspirational. Indeed, Article 22 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights provides that the Union must just simply respect religious diversity. This expresses a neutrality of the Union towards religions and is consistent with the foundational instruments of the community. They expressly recognize the category religious diversity, the need to work with religious pluralism, and the growth of interaction between religions in Europe and beyond. Indeed, non-discrimination is a fundamental principle of the European Union and provides for action to combat discrimination on account of religion and belief in accordance with Article 13 of the Treaty of Rome. Another reason for it, for this commitment, is social cohesion. Non-discrimination on grounds of religion or belief expresses a basic principle of social cohesion and should be incorporated in all levels of the strategic approach to cohesion. But how do we mention and how do we measure a nation's religious identity? Firstly, we tend to measure religious precepts through a very Christian lens. Example, religion is doctrine, practice plus time set aside for religious activities. Example, church attendance. On that point, I think that notwithstanding declining church membership or diminishing worship, the UK is still largely a Christian country, if by that we mean the dominant faith of the land. Yes, institutional religion has declined as a cohesive force, giving meaning and stability to communities, or as Charles Taylor put it, religion has lost its public hold. But our calendar, our formal occasions, our legal system, our social and literary reference points, our cultural memory, all this is still lar largely rooted in the context of a Christian Europe and a Christian UK. Even the possible split in the Anglican communion over same-sex marriage still makes top news. These are the factors which keep Christianity alive as a social force, even if its doctrines, rituals, and beliefs are becoming increasingly elusive to society's cultural structures. The larger point, that religion with all its complexities, its blurred boundaries, still continues to be a central feature of human life, giving shape and meaning to our exist existence, is often lost in the frequent media attention given to contesting whether religion is a force for good or bad in the modern world. So our conversations are not really so much about religion and religion practice, but about the possible reach of religion and how does one protect the perceived public space, which is considered to be secular. And here, religion is often seen as something which drags us back to an intolerant past, whereas secular societal and political norms ground us in individual freedoms and pull us towards a hopeful future. And in many ways, I can understand why, because secularity as a process has been successful. The rise of democratic rule, the concept of civil society, the consciousness of human rights and individual freedom have all accelerated the growth of secularism. But I think that despite a certain fading of public religiosity, secularism isn't the only challenge, so is Islam. In the face of a growing Islamist threat, the return to familiar historical tropes of pitting Christianity against Islam continues to essentialize Islam as the archaic and often unwelcome other of Christians, Christian and Anglo-Saxon Europe. Its beliefs and practices are too visible and awkward, and it doesn't quite fit in with the demands and attractions of modern Western life. 
As one student recently said to me, my mum's only Christian when Islam's in the news. And it's not the doctrines that anyone is particularly interested in, it's values. Values, I think, have become the major criterion by which we discuss contemporary ethics in society and politics. And in some ways, I would stretch it to say almost as far as that I think values have become the new religious discourse. As Anne Norton has re recently written in her book on the Muslim question, that while once it was a Jewish question, today the figure of the Muslim has become the axis where the questions of political philosophy and political theology, politics and ethics meet. Islam is marked as a preeminent danger to politics. It's a preeminent danger to Christians, Jews and secular humanists, to women, sex and sexuality, to the values and institutions of the Enlightenment. And conversely, for many Christians who hope for a return of Christendom, only a Christian Europe can accommodate and welcome Islam. Some of you may have read John Milbank's tweet last year. I don't know if you know of John Milbank, but I'm assuming some of you do. Um, a retired professor of Christian theology at the University of Nottingham. Uh, Radical Orthodoxy was John Milbank's project. And last year, when he tweeted about the singer Sinead O'Connor's conversion to Islam, whatever you think of either John Milbank or Sinead O'Connor, he writes that Michel Houlebecq has it right Liberals will embrace an author authoritarianism to escape their own contradictions if it's respectably other and non-Western. Sinead O'Connor is a civilizational traitress. She has no taste. The modern West is defended by many as the legacy of Christianity. Western cultural norms are homogenized in the desire to see them as a product of Christian values. So the liberties we all enjoy, such as the rule of law, social pluralism and religious freedom are seen as what the Christian West stands for. This may be contested, but it's a popular perspective. And it's one which is often hijacked by politicians whose defense of British Christianity is often seen as self-serving, creating division rather than uniting communities. The differing civilizational tendencies with John Milbank and the philosopher Roger Scruton and some others insist upon so I think that we have to be careful how we speak. We make civilizational choices when we do political theology. In the UK, there seem to be two distinct arguments which converge, especially around issues of free speech. The first is that multiculturalism has allowed for the legal protection of minority faiths such as Islam, Hinduism, Sikhism, and Judaism at the expense of Christianity, so that it's only the Christian faith which has no protection from ridicule or derision in the arts, media, and general public discourse. The second, rather simplistically, brings religious voices together as a collective of conscience against the state's deliberations and subsequent laws on a wide range of issues such as marriage or the rights of sexual minorities. The legal cases which reflect the tension between public morality and seemingly religious exceptionalism show that in the case of the UK, a nation's moral consciousness is far less grounded in religion and authority than it was only a generation ago. Theologians like David Ferguson, who is my colleague at the University of Edinburgh, have argued that if the established church is no longer recognized by the state in any meaningful way, if the established church no longer speaks for society, then Christianity does not need to be the moral voice Rather, along with others, it should provide an authentic moral voice in a world too often compromised and confused. And many Christian theologians call for Christians to have a distinct voice in the public sphere, which tells a different story from that, that of the state. And we heard some of that yesterday in Jonathan Walton's paper. But I argue the state is not morally neutral. It has its own commitments to equality and rights. And so I just want to give you a couple of examples. You're not the only country to have a cake case. So we also had a cake case, except it was called the gay cake case. And this is about Ashes Bakery. And I think it was resolved late last year or early this year. So the Christian owners of a bakery um, were accused of discrimination, this is in Ireland, against a customer by refusing to make a cake in which the customer had asked that they put the words, they support gay marriage. 
The slogan simply said, support gay marriage. The Christian couple, Daniel and Amy MacArthur, who ran this um, bakery in um, Belfast, uh, said they would not make the cake. They would make the cake for the customer, but they would not put that particular slogan on. This ended up going to the courts. And the couple won the case. Delivering the ruling, Supreme Court President Lady Hale said that the couple did not refuse to make the cake because of Mr. Lee's sexual orientation. Therefore, they did not discriminate against the customer. She said their objection was to the message on the cake, not to the personal characteristics of Mr. Lee or anyone else with whom he was associated. The bakers, she said, could not refuse to supply their goods to Mr. Lee because he was a gay man or supported gay marriage. But that is quite different from obliging them to supply a cake iced with, with, with a message with which they profoundly disagreed. Of course, Mr. Lee was profoundly um, upset by this judgment, and he wrote, the judgment today tells me that it's okay. I'm concerned, not just for the implications for myself or other gay people, but for every single one of us. Do we have to guess when we go into a shop whether we're going to be served or not? Speaking outside the court, Mr. MacArthur said, this is the um, owner of the bakery, that the ruling protects freedom of speech and freedom of conscience for everyone, and insisted that Mr. Lee was welcome to return to the bakery. They argued that the judges have given a clear signal today. Family businesses like ours are free to focus on giving all their customers the best service they can without being promote, forced to promote other people's campaigns. We just want to simply move on from this. European societies have long recognized religion's totalitarian aspects and so limited the extent of religious influence in law and politics. The emergence of a common civil space where the religious voice is not silenced, but simply one voice amongst others, forms a social fabric of most Western European societies. And I want to give an example of the French example of laïcité. The French method is to raise a sword when the display of a particular religion enters into conflict with the population and with that which serves as its identity, that is a republican ideology, which is a strong unified society without religion. It's a method that is clearly assumed, which could appear particularly repulsive to the outside. But the challenge of the French method is for the Muslims of France to become French Muslims. Therefore, in discussing the problems that the Muslims pose and resolving them one by one, the idea is to resolve them within the sense of a Republican ideology. This is the opposite of the English method. And I just want to give an example of one particular, I'm gonna take this off because I think it's going upwards and backwards. One example of the Guerin report in 2010 uh, the Geron report um, was about clothing. What is acceptable clothing in Western terms? And it was claimed that the French ban on the full face veil did not go against the freedom of dress because Western civilization had no such things as clothes for the face. The Geron report emphasized the French Republican values of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and had as one of its central arguments that the face veil eliminates the possibility for individual expression, thus disabling its wearer from being an equal in society. On this point, the members of this particular commission were clear. I quote, the face veil denies all individuality and thus all dignity to the one who wears it, whether she does so voluntarily or not. But the equal dignity of all human beings is a philosophical, even anthropological foundation of the principle of equality in the Republic. The discussions unveiling in Europe are now immersed in complex ideals of freedom, femininity, and faith. But there are also conversations about what we mean by the public space and what kind of social contract we enter when we enter the public space. The political philosopher Blondine Kriegel, who worked for President Chirac said, we believe in laïcité because we have to place ourselves in the public space by taking away from ourselves our individual characteristics from where we came, our roots, 
This is the idea of the social contract. So what she's arguing is that citizens should be presumed to agree to abide by general principles. So you can come with your different traditions, you can come with your different clothings and histories, but the movement is that once you enter French public space, it is pluralism by consent through unity. The public space should be neutral with respect to religion. And more recently, we've heard that the Flanders region of Belgium is planning a ban on halal and kosher slaughter because of animal rights campaigns. And some have claimed that the ban amounts to nothing more than anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. But animal rights campaigners have long asserted that the Jewish kosher and Muslim halal rituals are inhumane. So of course, the problem here is then whose minority rights win over um, when you have established communities in a particular part now being forced to rethink, I'm a citizen, I contribute, I've done everything, but now something that is so essential to the way I live, now that's being taken away because of another campaign. For most Europeans, the most problematic word around this whole debate is Sharia. The problem with starting any conversation on Sharia is exactly where do you start? Misleadingly but commonly translated as Islamic law, the term has become synonymous with penal law, stripped of its broader ethical dimensions and the fluidity of juristic reasoning. As Western Muslims have to think of Sharia today not only as a historical intellectual enterprise of the Muslim world, but also against a culturally Christian Europe. In public, but also Western scholarly debates, Sharia tends to be locked into important, but often poorly thought, if not downright contemptuous discussions on criminal law and women's agency. It goes down the positive law route, codified and defined as the West understands law. But the reality is that a word which for centuries belonged to the colonial other, considered low, even dead tradition, is now an observed reality in Europe. And for many Europeans, it rep represents an audacity, a hostility, an apathy to everything that the Enlightenment project has struggled against. And envied by some, despised by others, it represents a faith without boundaries. In popular discourse, Sharia is an all-encompassing term which is more akin to worship and custom than law and thus more susceptible to a variety of practices. The non-Muslim needs to be told that fasting and prayer, ritual practices such as halal slaughter, but also observance of aspects of personal law, that is marriage and divorce, are all Sharia. When a Muslim prays, that is Sharia. Eating halal or permissible is Sharia. Prohibition on illicit sexual relations is Sharia. For me, this is ethics and religious observance, not a parallel legal system. It is what I choose to live by and which does not go against any law of the land. It is worship in private and public, not a legal challenge to state law. It is combined with custom, and for the most part, the word Sharia should not have the word law next to it when we think of it as religious practice or worship. Terms such as Islamic law and Mohammedan law were colonialist constructions and don't really illustrate the complexity of Sharia as a conceptual tool and lived reality. And as a cultural anthropologist, Roger Ballard has argued, customary law is far from being law in Austinian terms. It is not grounded, nor is it enforced by the state. And it rarely exists in written form, if only because it is being reinterpreted all the time. Rather, it reflects the current normative consensus of the elders of the community. Nor is this kind of law particularly concerned about making explicit judgments, distinguishing guilt from innocence, let alone imposing sentences of incarceration. And having done so, it is not so much concerned with physical punishment, it concentrates on reparation. Aspects of Sharia are already in place here this is in the UK, but generally in the West, and where some are accepted, even encouraged, such as Sharia-compliant finance, others are condemned for disregarding individual human dignity. The phrase, what does Sharia say, 
is probably one of the most popular but misleading questions because it shows how superficially Sharia is perceived as it falls between the cracks of law and religion. And I just want to quote an article by Jonathan Burnside, who has written about the paradox of the place of biblical law on Western civilization. Burnside writes that despite the Bible's deep influence on Western civilizations, our assumptions are very hostile to the Bible having any influence on the modern world. And he writes, this is a quote, from a modern perspective, biblical law is a spent moral force. We do not see its value as law, and so the subject has hardly any traction in modern law schools. I don't know what it's like at Emory, but I'm just assuming. Nor the picture any better in other disciplines. It seems irrelevant to the study of anthropology, economics, politics, and psychology. The sole exception is theology and religious studies. Yet even here, few curricula focus on biblical law. Usually it's submerged within more general studies of Judaism and the Hebrew Bible. It's largely ignored in courses on Christian ethics. Our focus is on text rather than what the text is about, coupled with our reductionist views of the nature of modern legal studies. The Bible is a set of rules, even commands, which appear morally unattractive. Burnside explains that if we look at law as a set of rules, this simply overlooks the way in which law, at the deep structural level, consists of an endless permutation of legal re relations, whether it's between people, powers, freedoms, duties. It is law, he says, that shapes the vocation of society, for law makes possible all kinds of futures. And I want to give a just a few examples of um, some of the cases that have recently, I've been involved as either an expert witness or on which I've written a report which show how difficult it is for the legal profession, never mind the public space, to think of Sharia. So um, about three or four years ago, there was a, a factory that um, the case was brought to me, a factory where there were two Iraqi um, employees. And the factory was a dairy factory but which also then went into meat and pork. And the employees were paid on the basis of putting packages of meat on the shelves. The more packages you put, the more money you got. Anyway, the long short of this case was that the two Iraqis said they would not touch the pork packages because this was against Sharia. This was against their religion. And, um, so they came to me and said, well, what do we do with this? Because if they don't touch it, then we might have somebody else saying, we're not going to touch this or we're not going to deal with that. Where would this end? So how do you even start with something like that? Um, on the one hand, it would be very easy to say, yes, pork is banned in Islamic law and therefore they shouldn't have to touch it. But of course, the whole point of law is that you have to go into granular detail. And at no point in any of the jurisprudential text is, is touching forbidden. The only thing that is forbidden is consumption of, of pig flesh, let's call it pork. Um, so I argued that, well, actually, they can touch it, they're not consuming it, and um, so, you know, they shouldn't be exempt from this. So it went back to them. And then they argued, ah, but they also sell alcohol. We're not gonna touch the alcohol bottles. And of course, it's exactly the same analogy. So they lost the case. But I th the, the reason I want to tell you this was because most people and institutions in public life are simply, because there is such poor religious literacy, and of course, these issues are legally so complicated, where do you turn to in civil society for um, solutions to this? And maybe one of the first cases that I wrote a report from was probably one of the most um, horrendous ones really, which about 20 years ago where a father had come home, a Muslim elderly gentleman had come home and seen a young man in his daughter's bedroom. And he opened the door and he was, they were both sitting on the bed. He went straight to his room, opened his drawer to take out an ax as one has in their bedroom. And um, by which time the man had realized that the father was going to come back for him. So he jumped out of the window, this young man but the daughter ran downstairs after him. The 
father ran down after her and basically um, well, he killed her, but by stabbing her uh, 20 times. And th th when, the, when the case came to me, the defense were arguing that, could you not write something for mitigation, like he's an old man, cultural issues, issues of honor? And I said, no, this was murder. Um, he knew what he was doing. You know, you don't stab somebody 20 times and not know what you're doing. And um, they said, no, no, if you could just write something for us. And I said, no, I'm not going to do this. Uh, because I don't agree with the premise of what you're saying to me. And they said, no, no, just, just do something. And I said, you're going to pay me for something you're not going to use, which is exactly what happened. Um, but they came back and they did say that it's really important for us to be now aware of this. This is about 20 years ago. That we can't simply slide things under, oh, well, this is cultural and this happens, which leads you to think that for so long this had been happening. And in the last 20 years or so, I see a shift in the way people approach these issues. And the most recent one, which is the, um, uh, the arrest of several Asian communities who've been arrested for being part of grooming gangs of young, of young girls. But the problem with all this is not just that you actually manage to delve into the, you know, what is the right thing to do, but actually they all unfortunately feed into this seamless narrative that Muslims have different values. So one case will now reflect the whole community. Let me just move on. When European empires collapsed during the course of the past half century, we saw new found jurisdictions, primarily ordered as nation states, geographically constrained within the boundaries laid down during the imperial period and when the European colonialists um, entered these Muslim countries, they deployed administrative and legal structures which owed far more to the premises of the Enlightenment than to those of traditional Sharia. As Wail well al has observed, the most pervasive problem is the legal history of the modern Muslim world has been the introduction of the nation state and its encounter with Sharia. It would be no exaggeration to state that there is no, virtually no problem or issue in this history that does not hark back to the conceptual, structural, and institutional discord that exists between the thoroughly indigenous Islamic customary law and the European grown imports that were the inevitable concomitant of the nation state and its modern legal system. But the nation state has not really been able to flatten the public space and religious groups have always relied or created exceptionalism to define themselves from majority rule. Just to go back in history a little bit, in his recent work between Christ and Caliph, Levi Weitz examines the multi-confessional society of early Islam through the lens of shifting marital practices, practices of Syriac Christian communities. He argues that despite the growth of Islamic law and governance, in these Arab lands, which were dominated obviously by Christian communities from the seventh century onwards, Syriac Christian bishops created new laws to regulate marriage, inheritance, and family life. The bishops banned polygamy, required that Christian marriages be blessed by priests, and restricted marriage between cousins, seeking ultimately to distinguish Christian social patterns from those of Muslims and Jews. Their desire was to be a community apart while still maintaining a place in the Islamic social order. Household life was tied to religious, and this interreligiosity lay at the heart of the medieval Islamic empire. And I think to some extent not much has changed, that we use this loose definition of law in the Islamic world to set apart. Um, but it's become more contentious now because of the nation state and because of the legacy of colonialism on Islamic law. Today, the modern nation state has a power to penetrate all layers of society in a way that was simply incomparable with anything in the pre-modern period. In any other field of Islamic jurisprudence, if this much change had been witnessed, the scholar would have taken great care before simply transferring rules across centuries. We tend to project the vertical relationship between the modern state and citizens back into the past. 
but it's been well argued in a current reflection by Wala Wuse and Thomas Parker. Societies were in fact much stronger than they are now, with Muslims often having multiple relations, whether that was to the Sufi uh, society, extended family, or others. As such, power was far more horizontal than it, than it is now, and much of what we now consider political world in the pre-modern era was actually located in the social. This can be seen in how the Arabic word siyasa, which originally meant something closer to statecraft, that is limited to the executive, now just means politics or political. Today, the ulama are either despised, that is the religious scholars, for keeping a tight grip over the traditional religious norms and practices, having lost institutional independence, or they are subject to the whims and nostalgia of certain Muslim communities having unrealistic expectations of them. I say unrealistic because we are in a world in which knowledge is ever expanding and disciplines further branch into subdisciplines. Studying religious sciences alone does not equip you for the moral and ethical challenges of contemporary life. For many, religious faith holds a deep anxiety towards modernity, but all of us are shoulder deep in modernity and for the most part have embraced it, even welcomed it. In terms of Sharia, what was once seen as intellectual strength of a discipline could now be perceived as its very weakness. The lived realities of most Muslim societies has multiple layers of observance and practice. But today, who does have the authority to speak, educate and direct? This is subject to polyvalent views and voices. Scholars have explored this dilemma in various ways. And in his book, again, Weil Halak writes, The Impossible State, that with the onset of modernity and colonialism, he argues Sharia is institutionally defunct. But it continues to serve as a moral resource in a modern world. An increasingly secular public space in the West, and also in the Islamic world, which also is very secular for the most part, has made public displays of subjective notions of piety at the very least awkward, and for some challenging the very values of the West. So we have an increasing number of writers now saying that although Islamic law was the queen of sciences in Muslim traditional societies, what we have now lost is that law should always have been tied to ethics. What is the ultimate aim of law? What is the ultimate aim of saying you should pray or you should fast or you should marry in this way? And many of the Muslim thinkers of the pre-modern period said that law has always got to be relational, just like ethics. And what we're finding today is that law and ethics might actually be different, distinct disciplines. Islamic history has been the history of conquest and empires, glittering civilizations and rich legacy of science, art and literature. But I think that Islam in the West has now been gradually reduced. It is Islam of headscarves and terrorism, arranged marriages and honor crimes, a constant battle between halal and haram. And it was against this background that I accepted the challenge, uh, what Silas had referred to, of chairing the Sharia Review in 2016, knowing that nothing alarms people as much as the word Sharia. So I'm just going to paraphrase, um, I'll summarize the review, and I think for those of you coming this evening, we can talk about it in more detail. But the review was really part of um, the Home Office's counter-terrorism strategy, although they didn't call it that. But it was to see whether Sharia councils, which are sometimes called Sharia courts, misleadingly, what actually happens in these councils. Because for decades now, there's been criticism that what happens in these councils is a parallel legal system. That there's only one rule of law, and that Muslims are, through these councils, uh, have instigated or created another parallel legal system. There are no Sharia councils in Scotland, so the review looked largely at, and I, we couldn't find any in Wales either, so they're predominantly in England. Very little, I mean, there is some research on these councils, but very little empirical research as to what actually happens. So we, there were six of us, I chaired the panel, there were two barristers, one retired family court judge, and two imams, one Shia, one Sunni, who acted as advisors to the panel. And they were advisors because they had links with the community. And what we found was, we, there was a call for evidence. It was extremely um, 
controversial as soon as it went out on social media and on the news that there was going to be a Sharia Council. There was, the controversy was not, thankfully, about me. The controversy was that you need a judge to conduct this. You can't have somebody who has a Muslim faith um, organize or chair something like this because we know what the result will be, assuming that I would just defend Sharia councils. Um, they completely um, ignored the fact that the panel had a high court judge, two barristers, a solicitor, family law barristers. Um, so there was some controversy, but the Home Office continued with this. And anyway, over a period of a year and a half, we went to visit certain councils. We had evidence from women who'd used councils to find out what was happening. And we found that 90% of the work was, I think you can imagine, was granting divorces to Muslim women who had married according to Islamic law, but not registered their marriage as part of a civil registration. And the problem with that is that they are only married under a religious system, but they're not married under the civil law. So when they want to divorce and their husbands don't wish to divorce them, where do they go to get their divorce? And the parallel there with Jewish Beth Dean courts was that Jewish women also face these limp marriages, they're called, where their husband might not wish to divorce them, where do they go? Except the Jewish Beth Dean courts are further advanced in the sense that they um, demand that where there is a Jewish marriage, there is at the same time, if not before, a civil registration as well. So the woman is protected. But the parallels were there. Our first job, really, was to dismiss the myth that these were courts. They're not courts. The people adjudicating are not judges. They are simply a voluntary, voluntary association of people who are respected by their communities to act on their behalf. The most surprising thing for me was the number of young women who had simply chosen not to register their marriage because they didn't see it as necessary. For them, the religious marriage was the marriage that the civil registration was only an add-on. This, this uh, review came on the back of years of women's organizations already campaigning for Muslim women to register their marriage. But the review had kind of shot light, shone light on this particular issue, which had been the goal of many smaller organizations. So we found that there, the law is a law, Sharia councils are not courts, the core business is granting religious divorce. And that's one of the most surprising things was that the people who, who grant these divorces on behalf of husbands who simply will not let their wives go were quite happy to say that if these women had registered their marriage in a registry office or had had a civil marriage and had managed to get a divorce through a civil registration, they would recognize those as Islamic divorces. The woman would not need to persuade, or the man would not need to be persuaded to grant an Islamic divorce. The civil divorce would be tantamount to the Islamic divorce. The problem was that so many women were simply not registering their marriage. I have now recently found out that the European Council has actually um, confirmed the recommendations that we put forward. We put forward three recommendations. First recommendation was that Sharia councils, um, that there should be a cultural awareness training, that Muslim women and men needed to be aware of the consequences of not registering a marriage. The second recommendation was that um, Sharia councils are not courts, they're not a parallel legal system, and that they should be transparent. Um, should the state be interested? You see, the, the problem for us was you can't ban something that is a voluntary association. So there was a call from some right-wing commentators and tabloid newspapers, just ban these courts. How do you ban something that can take place in your living room? It is just a voluntary association of people. If you start saying that I'm going to ban something, first of all, you can't ban it. But secondly, what do you do then with men and women who are trapped in these limp marriages, especially women? So the recommendation which was the most contentious which the Home Office said they wouldn't abide by, was that the government should have some kind of monitoring system for a while. We weren't comfortable with that, but it was the closest that we could come to kind of solution. And if that monitoring system went al uh, alongside Muslim, a campaign to alert Muslim women to 
to register their marriage, then we would come to a point, ultimately, at which rear councils would no longer be necessary. They would just simply die out because there was no demand for them. But the government said, we will not um, endorse this recommendation because of freedom of religion, because we do not wish to interfere in the practices of a religious community. Which begs the question, why did they want the review in the first place if it wasn't to interfere? But anyway, so they are going to rec um, take on one of the recommendations, which is a whole campaign which has started about um, minority groups registering their marriage in order to protect themselves. Shortly after the report was published in 2018, a spectator blog, the spectator is a centre-right magazine, well, probably more right than centre, uh, commented, uh, so Justin Welby, the current Archbishop of Canterbury, had written a book in which there was one page on which he'd commented on Sharia. And basically he was arguing that Britain is a, a Christian country and that the values of Sharia and UK values are not compatible. I'm just paraphrasing. Shortly after the report was published, a spectator blog commented that Justin Welby, the current Archbishop, is right to take a stand against his predecessor, Rowan Williams' most controversial announcement that Britain should introduce Sharia law. Ten years ago, basically when I came here, Rowan Williams had suggested that parts of Islamic Sharia could be incorporated into UK law. His argument, which went completely over the heads of most tabloids, was that some kind of constructive accommodation was not only possible, but desirable to better integrate British Muslims. The idea provoked almost universal condemnation, and the Spectator blog said, and now, thankfully, William's successor has knocked down William's poorly thought through stance. I personally agree that reconciling any two legal frameworks within a single jurisdiction is problematic not because Sharia remains perfectly incompatible with what is called Judeo-Christian tra tradition, but for other reasons. After all, the Jewish Beth Deen is part of Jewish, not Judeo-Christian tradition. Plus, we have Catholic tribunals to carry out annulments as divorce is not recognized under canon law. An annulment is not a Catholic divorce, but rather says that the marriage never met the conditions to be considered sacramental. The annulment process is often long, usually lasting about a year. The people who make up the marriage tribunal for your diocese must perform extensive research in determining if an annulment can be granted. So if I am Catholic and divorced, can I get remarried? Perhaps, but only if you have received an annulment, which means that your previous marriage was not considered a valid sacrament. Let me conclude, I, and I just give the Jewish and the Catholic example as ways of expressing that when we really think about the challenges of religious pluralism and legal pluralism, we have to be honest as to all the communities that, are, that have found some accommodation or are doing their own thing. If Sharia is largely confined to worship and customs in Western countries, and how does the state ban ritual practices within the context of freedom of religion? And I would argue that it seems that while Europe as a whole is coming to terms with the cultural realities of Islam and the law in the UK, at least Islamic law, has come under the spotlight on a number of fronts. While the wider Western cultures remain suspicious of what Sharia might mean, Muslims also remain very divided as to what exactly is religious in religious law. Yet even if we radically rethink aspects of Sharia as ritual rather than law, it is in the area of social ethics which demands an interface with human rights issues and cultural pluralism, where some Muslim states and Muslims in the West face some of their biggest challenges. I think that Sharia itself should be desacralized, not because it is no longer relevant, but precisely because it is relevant, and so that it can continue to provide a framework for discussions which connect with a history and an intellectual tradition, but which recognizes the discursive realities and complexities that have always been the foundation of what it means to be 
Muslim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Siddiqui. Uh, we do have time for some questions. There are microphones in the aisles, so if you have a question, please cue behind the microphones, and uh, Professor Siddiqui can alternate back and forth between the two microphones. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to ask about a racial grammar. Uh, so ben Eduardo Bonilla, Bonilla Silva from Duke University talks a lot about racial grammar in the media and how it perpetuates misinformation and miseducation. And I think that's particularly salient when we're talking about Sharia and Jihad to a lesser extent, um, both here in the US and in uh, the UK, particularly tabloids like the Daily Mail. Mm -hmm. um, in a world where this racial grammar is addressed and we don't have tabloids constantly spreading misinformation, do you think that would make things better or do you think it would be essentially like what Said has argued in like Orientalism that the West will always find a way to other the East um, and that the UK and the US at large will just find some other boogeyman associated with uh, Middle Eastern culture to uh, perpetuate the other? So I, I have a slight problem with the word the other because I think in some ways we're all the other to someone. Um, and, I, and I take on board what you're saying about Said's work. The challenge for me, and I think sometimes you can't um, separate your personal story with the way you think, even as a scholar, is that the polarity between Islam and the West is a false distinction. And it's perpetuated, not just by tabloids, but it's perpetuated by not always fear, but simply indifference to whether we can even rethink a different paradigm. I don't think that everyone who perpetuates this is doing it out of fear or contempt or derision. Um, I think most people don't really care, to be honest. Um, but I do think that the, the challenge is if Muslims societies which, who, that are completely diverse, you know, we talk about community as if it's monolith, completely diverse, some are not interested in this debate at all. Whatever their uh, attitude is, they are part of the West. And the West is part of the Islamic world in every way, right from the top to the bottom. So as academics and scholars, I think it's imperative on us to constantly challenge not necessarily in a defiant way, because I don't think you can change everything through defiance. You can change things through constantly talking about them. Sometimes defiance has the opposite um, consequence. People become even more entrenched. But the values of, let's say, liberalism, the values of personal freedom, the values of um, simply having the freedom to choose your life are really seductive. And I think that as ta if you put aside um, the academic grammar of this, you know, how do we talk about this? What is the lens? It's true, the lens is largely Western and it's largely theologically, it's very Christian-centric. But that's fine, that's a reality. How do we then as scholars take on that reality but actually then say, but there are other ways of thinking about this? And, the reason, one of the reasons I went into this whole discipline of Christian Muslim was I realized that a lot of people think that what's important in one religion has to have the same relevance in another. So I would always get Christian theologians asking me, well, what is salvation? And I, well, I don't really think of salvation that much in that sense. But I realized the reason why they were asking was because salvation is key to Christian theology, what the, 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 the different contours of salvation. And then gradually it occurred to me that so much of our language, as you were arguing, is not necessarily maliciously, it's just the reality. And so for me, it became, dare I use the word, a personal jihad, to say, actually, we do need to constantly have these conversations to just mutual education. It's not about saying necessarily, I mean, I, I agree with some of the points that Said makes, but I think what it doesn't address is that Muslims are part of the West. So on a very high level academic discourse, you can have these abstract, but how do you deal with the lived realities of people who may say, I am this faith, 
but also want to enjoy all the freedoms of the West, but also want to decry the West, it becomes really tortuous. Thank you. So, thank, you for, thank you for your talk. I was struck by the example you gave of Muslim women who don't, um, Muslim couples, I guess, who don't take the extra step of um, registering their marriages in the civil registry. And I was just curious about, you know, sort of the divorces that um, are handled through the Sharia tribunals, these informal tribunals. How, how successful are they? And are there so, sort of general principles that are emerging that um, women that want, Muslim women that want divorces can start to rely on now? Or is it really imperative that they should, they should really make sure they register, they have the civil registration as well, and that will resolve their issues if they need a divorce? So the, I think what we observed was that the, one of the problems in personal law is that it's still stuck in a very traditional framework. So whereas other areas of the law have moved on, largely through colonialism, personal law, laws of marriage and divorce are still very conservative in many ways. So you're coming from traditions where things weren't really written down. Most people don't cling on to their marriage certificates. They do now, but for centuries they didn't. Um, so one of the ways it's changing is that there's paperwork now, which sounds really basic, but paperwork for marriages, paperwork for divorces. So the way these council, um, the people managing the council, will put gentle pressure on the husband, whatever that means, to, um, you know, why aren't, they'll call them in. The standard practices that we see now in every one of these councils, they say, we wouldn't exist. We're only here because there's a demand. If they registered their marriages, we wouldn't exist. They see themselves as charities, so they claim a tiny bit of money to do the administrative work. But they argue that um, they will call both husband and wife in, try what they shouldn't be doing. Though this is the problem, it's really gray. They shouldn't be um, arbitrating. They shouldn't be trying to reconcile this couple. But they do all that because it's so hard to separate what their cultural norms are from what the law is. That's a problem. But what some of them said that they do now, and they, these are becoming standard practices, which is petitioning, I'm using that word very loosely, for a divorce, and then having a divorce um, template, which once the husband has agreed, then the woman has. And the interesting thing was that these women were saying, it doesn't matter to us whether we have a civil marriage, we still want a religious divorce because we need to show our communities that we are religiously divorced. So they, they see a distinction between marriage under the eyes of God and marriage under the eyes of the law. And we're trying to persuade them that the two can be the same thing, but that's not how they see it. And are more and more of them becoming successful in getting their divorces? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Hi, um, thanks for coming. First of all, I really enjoyed hearing a British person talk about the differences between how we deal with these issues back home and how we deal with them here, because here it's like, where, when you say where, where do we look to, how do we figure this out, here it's the constitution, um, and back home we have such a different way of doing things. So thank you, first of all, I really enjoyed that. Um, I wanted to ask a question specifically about um, the controversy that's been uh, coming up in Birmingham where there was a primary, I think it's a primary or secondary school, teacher who was teaching about gay rights as part of the like civil rights education in the school and there was about 400 Muslim parents who were really upset by this and launched a petition and uh, they had teachers facing a lot of like clapback because of this and they're trying to deal with those competing rights as it is. How do you see like this particular issue but also framing that and the kind of stuff you've said about um, like how Judaism and Islam get so much more protection as it is, and we can criticize Christianity all we want, and how there are a lot of people on the right back home who feel like Islam is almost getting too much protection when it comes to sure. things like what we call civil rights, I guess. So this is a current case that was on the news this morning about the Birmingham school, is that right? Oh, I haven't read it on the news this morning. I read it, I just saw it being circulated about a week ago, but um, like, I'm yeah. looking it up on The Guardian, and I think- No, no, it's so January. this is about, it, the interesting thing about this is that, yes, there are Muslim parents, but there are also apparently Christian and Jewish parents who also don't want this. Oh, that's so this is, really this like is a, a new initiative by a headmaster from a, in a Birmingham school 
um, with a whole emphasis on how do you teach children sex education. He's arguing that this is not sex education, this is sex and relationships. So we're going to, it's going to be very age appropriate, there are no images. We want to teach children that sex education, which had been the primary way of teaching children for centuries in the UK, is no longer relevant to contemporary needs, where children are becoming far more aware of things at a much earlier age. And the poor, the poor guy, with all his good intentions, has been uh, sidelined by a lot of parents, many of them who are Muslims, who are saying, no, this should be the parents' right to decide when we teach children about sex and relationships. So yes, you can have your nominal awareness at the age of 11, we can't do anything about that, but when it comes to actually discussing, and part of it is, the, how do you teach them about um, LGBTQ rights? And these parents are up in arms saying that this is not the logic behind the argument is not only that it's a parent's rights, but that if you teach children something, something, they become more aware of it. And that's not morally right in our religious community. That's their argument. Um, I don't think they're going to win uh, because, um, because the, st the bottom line for me is that equality under the law means you can't choose who is equality. Um, and therefore, Every time I have one of these issues, or when people come and ask me, well, what do you think? It's almost like saying, well, yes, the parents do have the right, and they can maybe add in the home environment, but they can't prevent this happening in the school if all children are subject to this. Um, I think parents already have certain rights, I'm not 100% sure, about keeping their children away from certain things, like religious assemblies, etc. But this is now going to be, if it passes, it's going to be law in 2020. And so there's this huge momentum now. I, I honestly don't think they're going to succeed. There'll be a huge ruckus, but ultimately, um, if it's going to be part of state education, it will be part of state education. Okay, thank you. Hi there. Um, so Slavoj Žižek has this criticism of what we call, or I think what we would all understand as sort of Western liberal tolerance, where you know, it, it's really a form of sort of smuggled in intolerance because the way he understands his tolerance is that, you know, you stay over there and do your thing, I'll stay over here and do my thing, and really we're just, it's a sort of like indifferent tolerance where we're, we're building walls between each other and compartmentalizing even more. So, I mean, really, I think I'd just be curious what you think about that proposition in general, but then also if you can see a way sort of beyond that to something, I don't know, richer or more substantive, especially insofar as we're talking about, you know, Sharia, not as law, but as a expression of faith and so on within, you know, Western liberal democracies and so on. Um, so liberalism can only tolerate liberalism. We know that. That's a problem. Um, but that's fine, because I think I'd be completely disingenuous if I said, yeah, these are the problems with liberalism, but I really want to enjoy liberalism, so just leave me alone. Um, I think that, this is why I go back to values, because I really do think that the way religion is talked about in public debates is largely through legal cases that come to light. And so therefore, there's very little public appetite to understand what is behind that case. Just in the last question, what, what are the issues? And so you get sound bites, you get op-eds, you get a lot of polarity between, of course these communities can't exist in liberal societies because they're simply not liberal. I do think that conservative societies are not just Muslim, but actually across the spectrum, really do have to rethink what does having faith in public life mean? Because you can't pick and choose which bits of the religion you want in public life then. Um, and so therefore, at the moment, I think, you know, one of the criticisms of multiculturalism is that it's a failed experiment. You know, it's led to an impasse. We, exactly what you're saying, that you just do your thing, I'll do my thing, was fine for decades, when the only reflection of multiculturalism was, can I get an Indian takeaway? But now, multiculturalism is, oh my God, these Muslims are so different. Um, and then, of course, that's been exacerbated by the whole terrorist um, tax in, in European societies. And of course, for some people, that is what has created division in Europe as well. So the whole migration issue in Europe is not really about migration. It is about the Muslim migration, though nobody will say that, apart from, I don't know, Viktor Orban might, but most people don't say it. And I think that's why for me, it really is important that 
that people care. Um, you know, you don't have to... You know, people often say to me, well, how do I make Muslim friends? As if I can give them a solution to that. And I say, it's not about making friends, it's just being open to everything has a deeper debate behind it. Rather than reacting to things, just, just simply being aware that, that, you know, in some ways, Europe, despite what we're hearing about the current political issues, Europe in the last 30, 40 years has not had any struggle. And the, the contemporary political struggle or social cohesion struggle is even, that itself is not that big. It's been exacerbated by economic polarities, um, different directions of the European Union. But underneath it all, the social fabric is always about, the social question is always about, can people with very different values live meaningfully together? And I'm not sure that they can. I think they can live together. But if meaningfully means what you're saying, a richer, I think some will say, well, that's what we're doing anyway. You know, European societies are rich now. But many would argue, no, you're just indifferent to the others. You're, you're just living. You're... But then you argue, you know, you'd think, well, why should I care? Why should I be thinking that our diversity is a good thing? Because we get told that all the time, but nobody tells us why diversity is a good thing. In the sense, now of course, I do believe diversity is a good thing, but I think that whether it's in institutions, whether it's in politics, there's simply a statement that, to be fair, has also come out of the liberal agenda, that you need to have diversity in every institution. So I can't criticize that, but what does that mean in really challenge? You know, pluralism is very fragile and it's extremely challenging and it only takes one incident for people to think, you see, I told you there's no way we could live together. And then we move on and we continue to live together. But we don't actually move on to anything new. We just continue to live together. I do think though in the last five to 10 years, things have shifted a bit, precisely because people are aware that if all communities don't come together in some way, even though that sounds a little bit cheesy, if they don't come together in different ways, then the rhetoric of right-wing extremism will be just as powerful as the rhetoric of Islamist extremism. So I just wanted to ask if you could clarify a little bit more, and maybe I missed it, uh, what you mean when you say that law and ethics might be different and distinct disciplines, especially because uh, it seems to me that uh, laws are ref a reflection of the morals of society, uh, especially when it comes to criminal issues, uh, at which point the penal aspects of Sharia might be relevant to a legal system and not just as a religious tradition. So I was wondering if you could clarify that distinction for me a little bit. I think the argument, sorry, I think the argument by contem some contemporary scholars is that that Islamic law has been reduced to do's and don'ts. You, you should do this, you must do this, this is what you don't do. As opposed to what is the, the maqasid, let's call it, what is the ultimate purpose of this ruling? Now you could argue when it comes to worship and piety, maybe there is no ultimate purpose beyond worship and piety or closeness to God. But when it comes to issues around criminal law or marital law or divorce, so people have argued, there's a, a few years ago I gave a lecture in which, is it okay to text a divorce? Because this was happening in certain Middle Eastern countries. On the basis that unilateral divorce is valid under classical sh Sharia or jurisprudence. And I haven't even gone into the distinction between the two, between Sharia and jurisprudence, but let's just say that so unilateral divorce from the man is valid. If unilateral divorce is valid, then surely it doesn't matter if I just text a divorce. She doesn't even have to be in the same room as me. I can just say, I divorce you. So a couple of, this was considered to be valid in a couple of Muslim countries amidst a lot of uproar. The ethical dimension or reaction or defiance of this was that no, the whole point is it is that 
you have to treat, you know, why am, why am I not seeing this? You have to treat your wife with respect. She has to know, she has to have advance warning. She used to be given time over three months. Um, there has to be a reconciling process, all kinds of different arguments, alongside the more human rights arguments, which is women arguing that we've made so many strides in the last few decades, and is this all it takes to take us back to square one? So for me, that is that ethical dimension then. You could be right in saying, well, actually, unilateral divorce, I divorce you in a single setting, which is considered wrong, but is widely practiced, could be seen loosely as part of Sharia. But is that ethical? Is that the right thing to do? Is that what the whole debate on marriage and divorce, whether it's in early Islam or later Islam, is? And we can't get away from the fact that People want to be treated with respect. People who say that you can just do this because technically and legally you're okay to do this, where does that leave the wider framework of the society in which we live? And so there are scholars who've argued that the ethical dimension, which is always relational, what is your relationship to the other and to society, is now being reduced in Islamic law where people can now get away with just saying, I'm just in the lines, in the confines. An example of this is, I don't know whether anyone knows this here, but there's a classical tradition that one of the biggest um, uh, um, uh, representatives or scholars of Hanafi law, Abu Yusuf. So there's a whole zakat thing of giving away um, a percentage of your remaining wealth at the end of the year. So not wealth that you need, such as a mortgage or debts, but you're remaining, anything left over. And there's a tradition that Abu Yusuf used to transfer his remaining wealth to his wife at the end of the year so that he wouldn't have to pay zakat on it. And um, he was criticized by his colleagues who said, this is so unethical. He said, yes, but it's legal. And so for, for that sense that there's, you know, you say law and morality are the same thing and law and ethics, they're not. Um, so, yes, I do think sometimes the law drags us into an area that we go kicking and screaming, and it's a good thing that it does that. But I think the law is not always ethical. I once did a little experiment with my undergraduate students, it was about criminal law, and I said, they looked at me in shock actually, I said, if, if you committed something and you had the, a really bad crime, and you had the choice of having a finger chopped off, or 30 years in imprisonment, what would you choose? And 25 out of the, I think it was about 28, 29, said they would rather lose a finger. And then I, I reassured them that, that we weren't role playing. And then I said, the reason I'm asking is because our concepts of what is justice are different in different, not societies or religions, but across time. So when the British went to India, one of the first things they did was try to rule out all forms of mut physical mutilation. So you could end up in prison for decades, but they wouldn't let you physically um, carry out any of the kind of punishments that were rarely carried out anyway, but there was always a threat. And for them, the, the, their argument was that m human moral progress means you shouldn't physically mutilate for punishment. Um, when I asked these students why they would rather lose a finger, they just said, well, because it's short, sharp, and we still have our freedom. Um, and when you think about some of the um, debates around the death penalty here, how do you align that with so many other notions of individual freedom and liberty and right to life? It's, it's not about saying one is right or wrong. It's really about saying there are different ways of conceiving things. Um, and we need to be aware that people make judgments for a variety of reasons, irrespective of whether they're Muslim, non-Muslim, or whatever.